Five months after the release of Red Dead Redemption, Rockstar took their very first real attempt at a zombie game, technically. And they did it in the safest way possible, by taking the base game of Red Dead Redemption, using everything that game had to offer as a means to bring their undead vision to life. And that meant reusing the same world, that game's entire map, all of the assets, weapons, sound effects, characters both significant and otherwise from the game main story would also return in some way, shape, or form. Red Dead Redemption's main protagonist too would make a return as a story star yet again. All of this came together to be one of the most unique post-apocalyptic stories of all time. Set in the Wild West, a land of frontier and tamed by civilization, or at least in the very infancy of becoming tamed by this new civilized approach. A civilized approach that took over how people interact with each other, how money's handled, society as a whole, and probably most importantly, how the laws to be upheld. To then be viciously and savagely torn apart by the gaming industry's favorite fodder, the zombies. Now pay her! <laughs> While it can be easily criticized for being quote unquote lazy by just reusing assets and bringing many characters from the main game back, it helped not only deliver as previously mentioned, the most unique setting of all time for a zombie game, but it also helped with its turnaround time, as development time and cost didn't have to be allocated for too many new things, such as new character models, new sound designs, new weapons, or an entirely new world altogether. This DLC was released in less than half a year, and it helped make so many people praise this DLC for truly being a standalone experience. since. That was pretty much how it was sold. While you would be naturally left out on some of the characters in previous interactions, like why John is already standoffish towards Nigel West Dickens when he finds him peddling his usual fake concoctions to survivors in Fort Mercer, or why Seth is really as weird as he is, these two initial interactions with John pretty much already sums up the relationship with them not really needing any more background. Putting up the argument that yes, Rockstar does do a great enough job at introducing both these characters and setting the tone for the relationship between John and the both of them, everything for a newcomer is already explained without feeling entirely lost as to who they are and why John is the way that he is when he has to deal with them. To someone just diving into this DLC, they can get John's eagerness and frustration to get dealing with Mr. Dickens done and over with. From the perspective of him wanting to deal with the man he's assuming caused this plague through his concoctions and, and not from the irritation from his previous encounters. Or how Seth actually has a history of trying to play John letting his own greed get the best of him time and again. There's a moment where Seth has his zombified buddy Moses try to get John. Moses, get him. Go. Yeah. Get him. Get me, Moses. This is not the first time he so brazenly turned on John. I also want to point out, in this DLC, there's rumors that Seth's glass eye causes play. A glass eye that, in the base game, John aided Seth in acquiring said eye because they believe they were tracking down some type of treasure. Honestly, Nigel and Seth aren't as good as an example as Bonnie and her father, though. There's a lot of history and important backstory behind her and her father. How they helped John, basically nursed him back to health, gave him a bed, a dry, warm, comfortable place to sleep in while learning how to hurt cattle and, and helping him get back on his own two feet. Knowing the history and backstory behind her and her father makes the death of Mr. McFarland in this DLC so much sadder. This man and his daughter, a family that's already suffered so much, has to endure one more death in the family. A death that was a direct cause of this man's selflessness and willingness to help others. The very same attributes that led to him and his daughter saving the life of John Marston in the base game. While playing the base game certainly isn't required, it definitely adds to everything this game game has to offer in terms of existing characters and people that return from it. It's even a little interesting to think that the very reason why it was criticized for being lazy actually benefited to them in the opposite direction. Rockstar left the whole world intact with John traveling from the United States down to Mexico to find the source of this plague. The entire world, from top to bottom, is here. Rockstar could have easily sliced it in half or sectioned off this entire concept for this DLC to just one portion of the game. They could have condensed it so much more if they really wanted to. But instead, they decided to take the entire world, the entirety of the United States, and the portion of Mexico that is fully explorable in the base game over into this DLC. They completely changed how town would work and the open world works. We're going from a world where you can see people riding by on horses, going about their business, doing their own thing, to now people being hoarded up in towns trying to defend themselves from any type of 
roaming hordes of zombies. Every town you come across, obviously because it is a post-apocalyptic setting, the shops don't really work. You're not going to be going into a general store and buying ammunition or trading in goods or anything like that. Instead, whenever you come across any type of town, you have to clear out the zombies. In order to make the town safe, in order to open up fast travel from this town to another town that's been cleared out, in order to change your outfits, and ultimately in order to make the surrounding area much safer to travel in, you have to clear out all these zombies, which is similar to how the whole gang wars in San Andreas works, where after you claim a turf or, or a neighborhood, or in this particular case, a specific town, after a period of time, you gotta watch out because then the town could come under attack by another roaming horde of zombies. So you're not always gonna be safe. Once an area is cleared out, there is a possibility that later on you're gonna have to go back and redefend the town yet again, but it's simple enough. I do also like how the zombies themselves work. There isn't just normal walkers. You have bolters, basically fast zombies you have fat zombies that charge you you have spitters and then you have the regular roaming zombies and all of them have to be killed by a headshot if you do any type of body shots it won't do any damage now considering there is no pc port the only way to really play this game obviously is going to be with the controller so aim assist is heavy definitely helps out a lot but in some ways i do actually like that a headshot is required in order to kill any of the undead if you have any type of body shots you're not going to kill them well that can be easily frustrating especially when you're being surrounded by a decent group of zombies i would still consider this to be a relatively unique approach to having to put a zombie down at least in the open world setting when it comes to resident evil and capcom obviously it's got to be headshots but when we're talking about third person open world games usually if you do an Enough damage to even the body that puts a zombie down but in this particular case you have to do a headshot and while that could arguably be frustrating i think it's incredibly unique and i think something that's always forgotten when it comes to the undead nightmare why it gets praised so much is similar to red dead redemption's base game it was unprecedented you don't really see the wild west be explored that much you know it's never really ever explored with the exception of red dead redemption and rockstar basically went all out with with this experience and then we have undead nightmare which takes everything that experience has to offer and turn it into on the surface something that just seems like it's zombie related but when you dive deeper into it there's so much mythology here and so much lore behind it you can't help but praise rockstar for the amount of research and effort they even put into this game story or this dlc story so basically summarize this if you guys have never played the undead nightmare it kicks off towards the later part of the base games campaign it breaks off into a parallel world where uncle an older character that actually lives on the farm with john and his family comes back from town and he's sick he's obviously zombified he ends up infecting aka biting abigail john's wife and then she in turn bites jack his son and now john basically hog ties both of them throws them in his bedroom and then heads into town to see if he can find any type of help. From here, there's a lot of rumors and murmurs as to the origin of this plague. Blackwater is completely in shambles. It's already been completely overrun. At this point in time, John comes into contact with a lady that's cowering in an abandoned store. She mentions, you know, basically burning coffins, which introduces a new activity into this DLC, putting all these zombies to rest by lighting the coffins on fire. The activity is pretty straightforward and pops up a few different times. It just requires you to head to the local cemetery, burn a few select coffins, and when they're all lit ablaze, a character from the main game, be it the main story or someone who you ran into in the Strangers and Freaks missions comes to life and now you have to put them to rest by putting a bullet in their head. It's very easy and, as I said, straightforward. I wouldn't say it's repetitive since they are few and far in between. The map of Red Dead Redemption is fairly large, so if you want to go from cemetery to cemetery, it's not all that tiring, as there's a lot of ground and ultimately time you have to cover in order to go from one cemetery to the next. I actually found myself getting sicker of clearing out towns much faster than doing the cemetery since there's many more towns and some of them require you to go through multiple waves of zombies, which is indicated by the bar and few circles above it. Some towns, you only got to do two circles or a few waves of zombies while others require double that. However, clearing out the towns are much more rewarding than the cemeteries. Cemeteries are more as milestones for the actual story. Towns themselves, while they can play a part of the story and progressing it in a few select parts, it requires you to have a decent amount of progress within the open world itself in order to push the story forward. But as I said before, clearing out the towns gives you access to fast travel. It makes the area much safer to travel in since there's less zombies roaming around. You can also save your game in a safe town and every time you 
save a town, you get access to a brand new weapon. Not an entirely new weapon, most of them are from the base game, but you start out the Undead Nightmare with just a repeater rifle and a six shooter. Even though the Undead Nightmare picks up well into the main story's arc and you would have collected all the weapons by this time, it just gives you an extra incentive to recollect all of them by, you know, clearing out these towns. So while it can be a little bit much to constantly have to clear them out on top of ensure that they stay cleared, there's a lot of reason to work on them since you're getting your entire arsenal back on top of whenever you clear out of town, there's a couple chests that you can loot for some extra ammunition. Ammunition in this game is very scarce. You're basically going to be getting it from dead bodies, if not from these chests that you're clearing out by saving these towns. That is, with a few exceptions, like the blunderbuss. An explosive weapon that takes zombie parts in order to craft ammunition. Or holy water by crafting it using the holy kit. Which circles me back to what I was saying earlier. With items like the holy water, or the blunderbuss, or breaking in the four horses of the apocalypse, killing Bigfoot, or even killing the chupacabra in Mexico. Things that actually hold significance in the religious and world of mythology. Items that aren't really explored all that often in games, let alone really a zombie game. Yet you can imagine in the time of a plague during the 1800s, this is definitely how the population would act. Creating holy water, burning coffins, banding together to save towns, or in this guy's case, turning to conspiracy theories. They sound like Jews. I don't know. Why? Why? <laughs> This whole thing is nothing but a Jewish plot. You do know that, don't you? I find that highly unlikely, amigo. Well, I don't like Jews. Or colored folk. Or natives, now that you mention it. Well, you're a nice, kind-hearted man to meet in a time of trouble. Kind does not come into it. Why? What are you talking about? Why? I bet you like Catholics. I can't stand them neither, nor women, Fabians, socialists, homosexuals, Asians, or British. Between them, they've ruined this country, ruined it. It was a good country once. Now people are eating each other, and it's all the fault of the Jewish, British, Catholic, homosexual elite and their ideas. Well, I, for one, won't stand for it. Theories that are still somehow very rockstar in expression and belief. I still think Undead Nightmare has aged pretty well. I wouldn't necessarily say phenomenally well, I think, by seeing how it performs on the PlayStation 5, which, don't get me wrong, a steady 30 FPS is exactly how it performs, as I'm sure many people expect it to, but there's still large sections of the world itself being empty, there's not that many roaming zombies. You know, with this game coming out all the way back in 2010, you can start to see the cracks of age. And you can kind of see how a DLC of this size now with, say, Red Dead Redemption 2 would have been a massive undertaking. It's not the same thing as what they did with Red Dead and Undead Nightmare. I think Red Dead Redemption 2 would have required a lot more time. Would there have been as much of a return? I don't necessarily know. And seeing Rockstar's mentality and how they've been approaching their own legacy of games, I think if they've even decided to go the route of quote-unquote rem mastering this type of DLC with Red Dead Redemption 2, it may not have even been to the same quality that we've come to expect with Rockstar itself. And while with the original Red Dead Redemption, I still think having Undead Nightmare come to the PlayStation 5 is beautiful. It introduces so many new players to this type of experience and it's a time capsule in of itself. DLCs aren't really made like this anymore. Games aren't really made like this anymore. This was a spin-off game while also simultaneously being a DLC. Spin-off games are more commonplace now, but for the time, for this setting, and for what the game itself actually was, Undead Nightmare was unprecedented. And similar to the game that it's based off of Red Dead Redemption, it's a game, an experience, that should continue to be cherished. I just wish with the PlayStation 5 version we got to see much more zombies on screen and then be a little bit more aggressive with how many enemies we get to deal with simultaneously, how many zombies we see roaming out in the open world, or even adding in a few additional mythological creatures or concepts like a minotaur or a pegasus, you know, something unique, something crazy that they couldn't quite do back in 2010 that we can do now. You could say that's just yet another unfortunate missed opportunity by Rockstar.